If you've ever had a debate with a creationist, it's likely that you've had the experience of presenting numerous documentations of evolution, such as the artificial selection of dogs, or the natural selection of silent crickets, only to have them push it all aside and assert, that's just microevolution, not macroevolution. No one has ever seen one kind of animal become another kind. It's fun, isn't it? It's a great experience. <laughs> this is macroevolution cannot occur. Debunked. So let's start by laying down some groundwork, beginning with definitions. What exactly is the difference between evolution, microevolution, and macroevolution? Well, within evolutionary biology, evolution is defined as biological change over generations, and it encompasses both micro and macro evolution. Microevolution is biological change over generations within a species, and macroevolution is biological change over generations outside of a species, and that is the only difference. They both rely on exactly the same mechanisms, that being genetic mutation and natural selection. But this raises the immediate and very important question, what's the definition of a species? A species is defined as a group of individuals that are able to produce viable, fertile offspring. And so, for example, the Chihuahua and the Great Dane are the same species because they can successfully interbreed, despite their anatomic differences. Whereas the Asian elephant and the African elephant are two separate species because they can't successfully interbreed, despite their anatomic similarities. Now microevolution, that being biological change over generations within a species, is supported by overwhelming evidence, and it's accepted by almost everyone, including the most scientifically illiterate of creationists. Hell, even Kent Hovind accepts it. Now that one happens. I think animals can produce a whole variety of offspring. You know, long hair, short hair, long legged, short legged, that happens. But macroevolution, that being biological change over generations outside of a species, or speciation, is not accepted by creationists, despite the fact that it's also supported by overwhelming evidence. And so, before we move on, I'm going to present just two examples. The first is the greenish warbler, a ring species that's been generously covered by Holy Kool-Aid within one of my other videos. Evidently, this bird originated in the southern Himalayas and expanded over generations east and west around the mountains, and along the way they evolved, or adapted, to their new environments. By the time they met up north of the mountains, however, they had evolved, or adapted, to such a degree that they could no longer successfully reproduce. They were, and are, by definition, a different species. And the second example that I'll give is cuddly rabbits. Just as humans have artificially bred a multitude of dogs, so too have they bred a multitude of rabbits. But while all dog breeds can successfully reproduce, the same can't be said of all rabbit breeds. Namely, the Alaska and Florida rabbit can't successfully reproduce. They can both reproduce with other breeds, but they can't reproduce with one another. They are, by definition, a different species. They are an example of macroevolution. Anyhow, to get back on topic, with the evidence for speciation being overwhelming, the argument is over, no? I mean, surely, if we have overwhelming evidence of organisms adapting to such a degree that they no longer interbreed with one another, then macroevolution has been demonstrated, right? Well, the answer is yes, but here's where things get confusing. Those who assert that macroevolution cannot occur, such as Kent Hovind, Ray Comfort, and Ken Ham, define macroevolution not as biological change over generations outside of a species, but as biological change over generations outside of a kind. And they, like many creationists, change the definition of the word kind arbitrarily, and in doing so, they commit an equivocation fallacy. And I'll show you an example of this now. Do you know nobody has ever seen a dog produce a non-dog? Never. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you're going to get a dog every time. And it could be that the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. They probably did. But every five-year-old kid knows they're the same kind of animal. Kind? What exactly do you mean by kind, Hovind? That they're all of the family Canidae? That 
they're all of the order Carnivora, that they're all of the class Mammalia, that they're all of the Phylum Chordata, that they're all of the Kingdom Animalia, that they've all got hair, that they've all got limbs. I mean, really, how are you defining the word kind? You're pulling this definition out of your... See, if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Simple definition, can they bring forth? A dog and a wolf can mate and bring forth. A dog and a banana cannot. Oh, I see. You're using the same definition for kind as biologists do for species. Great. But hang on a second. The Alaskan and Florida rabbit has adapted to the point that they can no longer interbreed. And so, according to your definition, macroevolution has occurred, right? No, it's a variation and it's still a rabbit. That doesn't prove it came from a rock, folks. What? It could be that animals have diversified, like Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits, and no longer interbreed. Okay, but they're still obviously the same kind. They could originally interbreed. And there you have it, folks. Hovind has switched his definition. He's playing tennis without the net. In the one breath, he says, If they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Simple definition. But in the next breath, he says, Alaska rabbits and Florida rabbits can no longer interbreed. But they're still obviously the same kind. And hence, Hovind, like many proponents of this argument, commits an equivocation fallacy, because he switches which definition of the word kind he's using arbitrarily. Furthermore, and to hammer home a point that Potholer54 has made in relation to this very subject, if Hovind's definition of kind includes speciation, then he accepts macroevolution outright, but he just insists that it's called adaption, or as Potholer puts it himself. Hovind thinks a species will change over time as it adapts to new environments, and that's what the theory of evolution says. Hovind thinks this is because of natural selection, well that's what the theory of evolution says. Hovind thinks this will produce a variety of new populations of animals that can no longer interbreed. Yes, that's what the theory of evolution says. Hovind calls this variation. The theory of evolution calls it evolution. And finally, Hovind says organisms change but always stay within their own kind. And the theory of evolution can at last agree, since a kind is now defined as an organism that shares a common ancestry. And finally, I want to very briefly take on another definition of macroevolution, though it's certainly less popular. That being an increase in genetic information. So first off, know that I plan to dedicate a whole video to this nonsense at a further date, but to quickly smash it out of the park. Most of the proponents of this assertion accept microevolution, that being biological change over generations within a species, and so they've already lost the argument. If organisms evolving, sorry, adapting to have longer limbs, larger brains, and resistance to diseases isn't an increase in genetic information, then I don't know what definition of information they're using, but I'm willing to bet that they've pulled it out of their- No. So, to recap, the vast majority of those who assert that macroevolution cannot occur commit an equivocation fallacy, because they switch which definition of the word kind they're using arbitrarily. The truth of the matter is that the mechanisms that cause microevolution and macroevolution are exactly the same. And hence, to believe in microevolution but not macroevolution is to believe in inches but not feet, seconds but not minutes, or microaging but not macroaging. It is utterly devoid of sense. Anyhow, as always, thank you kindly for the view, and an extra special thank you to my patrons. Without you, this video likely wouldn't exist, and so, you're awesome.